Good morning. We're going to begin this session on evidence-based policy, translating research into practice. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, we may get one or two uh, additional folks who join us. Um, again, my name is Phelan Weirich. I'm a senior advisor in the Office of Justice Programs in the Office of the Assistant Attorney General. And uh, really, we're happy to have every one of you here today to talk about this topic, <coughs> evidence-based policy. You know, we've heard a lot of folks already talking about evidence-based programs and practices throughout the course of uh, this conference. It, and it's really a, a, a big hot topic, not just in, in justice and trying to address youth violence, but it really is a, a movement, I'd say, that's, that's sweeping multiple disciplines. And so uh, what we'd like to do today is uh, spend a little bit of time uh, addressing this topic uh, perhaps even demystifying a little bit uh, this topic and helping folks to come away feeling a little more fluent in being able to talk about the issues uh, related to evidence-based practice and policy. Um, so I'm joined by three of my colleagues um, that I will uh, quickly introduce and, uh, and then we'll move right into the uh, discussion and presentation. Um, to my left here is Jeffrey Butts. Uh, Jeff Butts is the Director of Research and Evaluation. He's the Director of the Research and Evaluation Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He also works on our assessment team uh, with his colleague Katerina Roman, who is uh, working to assess the overall efforts of the Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. Um, next to him is Martha Morehouse. Martha is the Director of the Division of uh, Children and Youth Policy at uh, HHS, Health and Human Services and uh, a colleague who've had, uh, had the pleasure of working with for a number of years now. And Dennis Monduro, also a colleague I've had the pleasure of working with for many years, is uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the Strategic Community Development Officer at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention in the Justice Department. So I'm, they'll be our discussants today. Uh, I'm gonna lead us through a little bit of a presentation to get us started and uh, this is a presentation uh, really we developed together. We talked through a lot of these topics uh, leading up to this because we really wanted to get beyond the, the most academic treatments of this topic and, and try to bring it home to people who are on the ground uh, trying to, to address these, really, these very real challenges and, and to bring evidence to bear on your decision making. But we do start with trying to you know, nail down some of the terminology and some of the issues here. Um, again, our goals are to increase, to increase and improve your fluency with this topic, with the terms and issues related to evidence-based programs and practices, um, to help you understand some of the advantages, but also some of the challenges to using evidence-based practices and approaches. And uh, we're certainly going to make sure we identify and discuss resources uh, that are available to you that provide more information on this topic. Um, to start with, you know, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no universal consensus on these issues. Uh, what's happened, and if you look at it from sort of a historical perspective, is that different disciplines and different fields have approached this topic uh, unevenly uh, and have approached it very much from a perspective of their own challenges and, and what they're facing. So medicine has, has addressed evidence-based approaches. And, uh, you know, we've seen it with, uh, with public health approaches. We see it here in justice as we're trying to address this issue. And, and it's funny because, in a way, from the perspective of justice, the term evidence isn't one that we're you know, unfamiliar with, right? So we use evidence all the time in courtrooms and in investigations, and we use it to make life and death decisions on a daily basis all across our country. So, so we talk about evidence, and, and it doesn't uh, seem like a, a foreign concept, but the way we use it here is fairly specific. Um, the, this is one way of viewing evidence, and I think it's a very inclusive way. Um, for our purposes, when we're talking about influencing policy, we're really talking about using evidence. Evidence is, is, the, is the findings that come from a range of systematic research, uh, program evaluation, or statistical methods. Okay? Now, the distinction here is really systematic. Okay? It's not me just saying, uh, I, I had this experience and this is what I thought. That's an opinion, right? That's a story. That's something that I'm telling you that happened. 
but it's not necessarily evidence until we've really gone about uh, in, in a systematic way of collecting that information using some fairly uh, well uh, recognized and understood social science research methods. Okay, so research, program evaluation, or statistical methods. And when you're trying to address a particular question, you know, the quality of evidence really depends on the quality of the approach, the method that you use to collect the information. So we put our preference towards the most rigorous approaches available for answering the question of interest. And the, the question of interest is really important because sometimes these discussions start in and people jump right to, well, this is the most rigorous method. Well, before you choose your method, you better know what question is you're trying to answer because you can't answer all questions with all different kinds of statistical methods. There's no one statistical method that answers all the important questions that we're gonna have to face as we go through this work, as we try to address policy questions and practical decisions. So what we try to focus on is this, 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 this term that we call evidence integration. Okay? And that's really this, it's really an orientation that we should all be trying to assume. One that, that embraces evidence integration. One that, in which we all look at how can we use these social science methods, research, statistics, programs, of that program evaluations, how can we use these methods and findings to help us guide the selection and development and implementation of programs, policies, practices, what are we doing? Right? It's, it's going to help you choose what to do. It's going to choose, going to help you choose how to do it and, and, um, and how to develop these things. Okay? And it can be a program. It can be just a way you do a certain practice within a program or, or within your overall set of activities. Or it could be a broader policy. So it's a really broad set of things. And I've underlined the word help because that's important. Because in Washington, D.C., when I talk and when, when, when anyone talks about evidence-based practices and policies, we get a lot of encouraging nods, yes, that's good. Because what people are thinking is, that means they're going to do something that's good with whatever money, resources, taxpayer dollars, etc. We all want to see that. But when I go outside the Beltway and I start talking to people out in communities, particularly the practitioners, the people who are doing the work on the ground about evidence-based practices or evidence-based <coughs> programs, we don't always get such a warm reception, right? Because to a lot of people, it seems a little bit threatening. It seems like what we're saying to them is, forget everything you've been doing for the last 30 years or 20 years or 10 years. Forget everything you think of as your own experience or judgment. Really, now what you do, you gotta listen to what these academics are telling you you've gotta do, okay? That's, that's a, that's a non-starter, okay? It doesn't work. It, you, you, people throw up the, the walls of defense from the get-go. So we have to assume this evidence integration orientation in which we say, you know what? When you're making these decisions about policies and programs, we just, there's another tool for your toolbox. We know you're gonna use your expertise. We know you're gonna use your judgment. We know you've got a lot of factors to consider, but one of them, you should have some fluency with these kind of social science methods. We should have some fluency with what is out there as evidence that's collected through systematic means so that you can improve your decision making. And we've seen it work, okay? But it's not, you know, it's not a magic bullet, it doesn't solve all your problems. But it's one more tool in your toolbox. Now, it's important to get through a few of these sort of basic understanding of issues. Evidence-based programs. When people talk about evidence-based programs, they're talking about something pretty specific. They're talking about a program out there that's gone through some kind of rigorous evaluation that's looking at the outcomes. And it's looking at that cause and effect relationship. We did X and it led to Y, okay? We intended to do these 10 steps. We in fact assessed it. We did some program evaluation. We in fact did carry out those 10 steps. We intended to have this effect on an outcome. We measured it, we compared it to a comparison group we in fact did see the outcome change that we intended, okay? So that's what we're talking about with evidence-based programs. Now, let me just be clear, I was talking about evidence integration. I was talking about policies, practices, programs. So evidence-based programs is one slice of what I would consider a broader bucket of evidence integration 
types of activities. There's another concurrent session going on right now on data-driven approaches. That falls into evidence integration too. That's part of using evidence, okay? But it doesn't always get you to the question, that work doesn't always get you to the question that so many people want to answer, does it work, okay? So when we're talking about evidence-based programs, that's the question we're talking about. Does it work? And I talked about the importance of knowing what question you're trying to answer and, and that drives your methods. When we're asking that question, does it work, it, it should focus our attention on a certain set of uh, program evaluation methods and approaches. Okay? There are certain ways that we're more capable of answering that question. Did program lead to intended outcome? Okay? So a couple of terms, these are really researchy terms, but we're talking about a couple of items that I think anyone can really understand. The researchy terms are internal and external validity. Okay, just very quickly, and it's up here on the board. Internal validity talks about the, the strength of that research design in terms of trying to establish that cause and effect relationship. That relationship between what you're doing, services, treatment, what have you. Uh, a, a difference in the way that your law enforcement are going to be deployed or, or whatever it is. That's your what they call an independent variable. The, the relationship between that variable and what you're trying to affect, your outcome of interest or your dependent variable. The strength of your design to be able to show that relationship is what we call internal validity. That's what researchers like me call it. External validity is something you also really care about. And that is, if I'm doing an evaluation or a study or some research of some kind, then I want to know to what extent does the population or the sample that I'm doing that research on reflect that general population that we're trying to make some statements about. So I might just be in Boston, and I might just be looking at a certain sample of people, but really what I want to know is, does this program work, is it going to work for a whole population of people out there that go beyond just who's being served in Boston? Maybe it's young adults who have uh, been arrested for a violent offense between the ages of you know, 18 and 24. Maybe that's my population. We want, to just, we want to make sure that those studies are being pretty clear about what their population they're studying is and whether there's, there's that external validity. Now, what I'm going to do next is uh, we're going to get into talking about what we, what we identify as a number of sort of myths. These are essentially things that people believe about evidence-based practices and approaches that may not be entirely accurate. Okay. Before I do that, I've kind of laid out a little bit of the, the terminology and a little bit of the social science base on this. I want to turn to my panel and, and just check. Jeff, Martha, Dennis, any comments on what we've talked about so far? How would you frame, if I've, if I've, framed, this, uh, if I've framed this poorly, how would you help us, how the group understand some of these issues beyond what I've said? Um, I would say, um, I, it's part of your systematic process uh, and orientation toward evidence and evidence integration. Um, I think about the importance of evidence in social policy and programs as sort of like in honor of yesterday's commemoration, sort of moving up the mountaintop. And there are a few programs which have reached the mountaintop, and I think we all see them up there. There's multi-systemic therapies, there's all the other programs that come up on that list when people automatically think of what's an evidence-based program. But there are a lot of other programs that are climbing the slopes and trying to get to the mountaintop. And that's the orientation, that climb, that continuing to build evidence, continuing to do studies, which may help us narrow in on the actual effectiveness of something. Um, and then there are some which haven't even started the climb yet, but have real appeal from a theoretical perspective. They make sense to us, um, but we haven't yet invested um, in the research it takes to start climbing the hill. Um, and the real risk of the evidence-based movement to me is when we just think about the top of the mountain and, and pretend like everything else down there doesn't count, and we're just going to pick a few things from the top. Couldn't agree more. It's not about, uh, you know, it's, 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 a easy, uh, it's, it's easy for us to fall into this thought that, you know, it's a backward-looking enterprise. You know, it's about who made it to the top of the mountain, as if this race is completed, or as if it's already been run, right? 
But one of the things that we were discussing in our preparation for this that I think is so true is that there's, there's many areas where uh, there's new innovative approaches that they haven't been tested yet. Or maybe there's even things that are well-worn, well-established well approaches in the practical world, but they just haven't been put to the test. They haven't really gone through the kind of evaluation. And I had the, uh, the sort of humbling privilege of, of standing before about uh, 350 victim advocates, okay? Now, victim services, now that's a group that's, that's they're driven by the heart, you know, they say they've got passions. A, a number of these people were victims themselves. To start talking to that group about, uh, you know, you need to really test and see if what you're doing is working. They'll tell you, well, listen, I know it's working. I work with these people every day. I see it, the change in their lives, and that sort of thing. Um, but even in that field, and, you know, we have to continue this conversation, not in terms of, uh, it's, it's not a game of gotcha, you know, oh, well, nothing works because you haven't tested it. It's a, it's, it's a recognition that we all have to be oriented towards this process, this process of developing evidence and developing a better understanding of what works out there through incremental evaluation, right? So you don't start with the most rigorous types of evaluation right out of the gate. You start to develop your evidence base, right? Um, so I'm going to move on to a few of these myths, okay? And, and here's the first one. There's really no need for evidence-based programs because we're already doing what works. We just need to do more of the same, okay? So this is, maybe someone's not going to come right out and say this to you, but this is something that folks basically believe out there. They don't want to hear about some sort of list of evidence-based programs. And in response to that, you know, it's true that we don't have evaluation evidence on, on everything, on all the programs out and activities out there. That was sort of our point just a second ago. Um, but here's what we also know. That in this line of work that we're doing, whether you're looking at prevention or intervention or enforcement, we've also seen you know, popular programs that have gotten a lot of attention, a lot of people out there putting them into effect uh, that you know, when they have had research done on them, when they have had program evaluation, the evidence starts to show that they're not producing any results. Or, worse yet, they're, produce, they're producing detrimental results. This is, this is serious work. It's difficult work. You're working with, uh, uh, you know, vulnerable populations. And, frankly, it's possible to do more harm than good. And, and so, I want to again turn back to, to our panel a little bit. And Dennis, I know working at Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, we've seen a number of these programs that, you know, sort of have a lot of popularity, a lot of people love them, but they just don't pan out in the evaluation. I mean, right now we're fighting the, the scared straight fight once again. Right. Uh, <laughs> there are other popular programs that are out there that. Um, have been embraced by certain disciplines that we haven't seen a lot of positive results on. Um, even some programs that we've seen good results on when implemented or without the, the integrity in the implementation, uh, which, which I think we're gonna talk about, um, can do more harm than good. When, when law enforcement says we can't arrest our way out of the problem, I know a number of you have been around long enough to have some perspective on this as well. But when I first started into this work, it wasn't too long ago, it was about 15, 16 years ago, they weren't saying that. They were basically, we're going to arrest our way out of this problem. Okay. Um, they didn't get there quickly and overnight. They got there by realizing, hey, gee, that didn't work. You know. And just another comment, I mean, there's a, I mean, there were, back to your uh, evidence and integration uh, definition and using the evidence and the, the data uh, as one way to help make decisions. I mean, there was a lot of, when I was um, back in probation, there was a lot of emphasis on um, boot camps, um, flatline results in boot camps, but less, less costly than uh, deeper incarceration correctional facilities. So there are reasons some of these programs do stick around. Mm -hmm. um, and then one more comment. Um, 
before I, I lose the thought. When you were saying that evidence here in DC means something, that it may not mean the same thing out in the real world, uh, I have to agree with you. I mean, evidence, when we put evidence based in solicitations, I'm thinking accountability. I'm thinking some type of assurance that uh, I'm covered as a federal employee uh, by re 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 reproducing something that's been shown to have effect. What that really means when we start to fund things and when things start to get implemented, uh, when we go back around, um, sometimes we're not as reassured. Uh, so I just wanted to, to make that distinction that when we say evidence-based, here within the Beltway, it probably does mean something very different outside of the Beltway. Yeah, and we're going to we're going to come back to that theme because we're going to talk a little bit about how different uh, how different sort of key players out there that uh, you're going to interact with that are critical players to the work that you do, how they sort of view this issue. Um, Kelly, did you want to? You look like you were chopping the. No, I, I'm just glad you're going in this direction okay. because because I think there's a, a real disconnect between what you. Um, fund as an evidence-based program and then how we as practitioners have to cram our resources and our knowledge and our abilities into what looks to, be, to us to be the evidence-based program and then return it to you to your point of this does not look like what I said out right. and so how do you, you marry those two correctly? Good well we're gonna get right to that um, so so this is our second myth we're gonna talk about program looks like it's working you can call it evidence-based. Now again, I don't hear anybody come out and say this statement, but I hear the word evidence-based thrown, the words evidence-based thrown around so often that it just becomes synonymous. I think that's what everybody means when they, that's the new lingo or the new jargon for good program. So if I'm telling you, you know, if I wanna convince you that I've got a good program, I'll say, well, it's evidence-based, right? And so this kind of brings us back to our, the statements and the definitions that we laid out out front. You know, the program has to be supported by rigorous evaluation evidence, okay? Um, so you, you gotta recognize, as you folks are out there doing this work in your communities, that there are gonna be people who are gonna come to you and say, hey listen, I got a program you ought to put in place, or I got a program you really ought to fund. And they might say to you, it's evidence-based. You, you don't have to, to, to be off-putting to them or anything, but if anybody says to you it's evidence-based, say, terrific, show me the evaluation, okay? Show me the evaluation evidence. I need to see it. And even if you don't feel like, gee, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to really discern the quality of that evaluation myself, don't worry about that. You got friends and partners in the federal government, at your other cities. You may have a research partner in your own city. <coughs> Just get the evaluation. You can share it with us, if nothing else, and say, hey, what do you think of this? Do you guys know about this program? I had somebody do that at the earlier session. Hey, I got a program that I've been looking at. What do you know about it? I said, well, not much off the top of my head, but we can certainly do some looking into it, okay? So ask to see the evidence. Just be skeptical. There's another one. There's, there's a variety of, of uh, online resources out there. Um, and they, uh, we're gonna point you in the direction of some of them. And I want to uh, you know, make sure that you folks get some understanding of, of you know, the ones that are out there, what you can look up, how you can use these. They're good. Um, but the act of going to one of these lists and finding a program that looks good to you is it's a good first step, okay? But that's all it is, it's a first step. Because if you draw from a good list of evidence-based programs, you can't, necessarily be re you can't necessarily rest assured that the results, you know, if you try to put this in place, are gonna be positive. This kind of gets to Kelly's point here. So, we talked about this a little bit as our group. I'm going to throw this to the panel and see if, if either Martha, you want to speak a little bit on this point. Um, what 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 are what are folks really doing? What are they getting involved in when they start thinking about trying to implement an evidence-based program? And 
what are some of the challenges here and you know to making sure you get those positive results so a couple of thoughts one is that these are designed to save you a lot of um, a blood sweat and tears basically the uh, research lists that have been put together are drawing on the fact that it's expensive and hard to do the tests of these programs. Most of it is funded by the federal government, though um, there are some foundations that have funded work. So the lists are bringing together the work that's out there, so you don't have to go find it all yourself. We um, have information on the findyouthinfo.gov site, and Phelan's provided the lists. Um, of some of the sites that essentially that's built from. So these have been efforts to pull out the youth-focused um, uh, work that's been done. Some start a little earlier in, uh, in, uh, for younger kids as prevention programs. Tell you what level of evidence is available for the program from what Jeff said, the trajectory from promising to having really substantial results using a rigorous design so that you have sort of at your fingertips the best knowledge we have about what programs work. Um, when you go after an evidence-based program, usually you're doing it because you're going to use resources and you really would like to get the results that have been found before. You want uh, a guarantee as much as possible on your investment that you're gonna get um, what you want. As uh, has been said sometimes, um, uh, programs are overrepresented in terms of you know how much evidence is behind them. I know in the early childhood world, when we had a push on evidence-based early childhood curriculum, one of the centers that was tracking curricula said there were 40 evidence-based curricula out the next week. So as um, uh, as Phelan was saying, you want to know in what kind of evidence it is, and these registries will describe the kinds of participants, um, what the community setting was, what the nature of the implementation was, and as you know, as said there, the task on your side is to figure out, is, is this the program for you? So what it won't tell you is how much does your community match the context in which this program was replicated? And given the time it takes to do these tests, a lot of programs have been implemented in only one setting with one demographic group, and you need to think through what it would mean to put the program into place and whether you can come close enough to the original program that you're likely to get the kind of results <coughs> that were found on the first time around. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of these lists uh, of evidence-based programs will provide uh, information about programs at a couple of levels. They'll, they'll, they may say that there's some higher level, like they say these programs are effective, and then there's some somewhat lower level, these programs are promising. Now, the, those distinctions are based not necessarily on the quality of the program so much as the, on the quality of the evaluation of the program. So we, we, it's more about how certain are we in the, the outcomes in that cause and effect relationship. So um, when you're looking at them, a lot of those programs, and particularly the ones in the, in the promising category, as it relates to youth programs and, and violence prevention programs, a lot of those programs are programs that were developed in cities just like yours. And someone said they had the resources at the state, local, or maybe they got federal funding or foundation dollars. They had the ability to do some evaluation work, and they published it. Okay, and uh, so. So this is work that you all can contribute to in terms of helping to build our knowledge. It was a really excellent point, I think, being made last or yesterday by you know Congressman Scott. Uh, you know, document what you're doing, help that next generation, and, and so you can be part of this process. But in terms of trying to you know replicate something that's been done elsewhere, here's the purest view. The purest view is is you are going to replicate, you are going to try to as closely as possible approximate all the conditions and all the activities that existed during the testing in, in the testing environment, during the testing period. So however they did it when they evaluated it, you should try to do it as most exactly like that as possible. That's the purest view. And there's no arguing with that logic. 
but the reality is, I think this is to Kelly's point, you know, the reality is that when you're thinking about putting a program into place, you're not walking into a, a you know, you don't have a blank slate. You know, usually if it's a, you know, if it's a youth service program, you're gonna start to think, well, what do we already have in place? We've got a facility here, we've got a number of workers here, we've got a variety of people who've been doing this work, maybe we can, you know, modify their, you know, their existing curriculum to be more in line with this, or if it's an enforcement program, the call-ins, you're working with officers who've already got some engagement and involvement in those communities, et cetera, okay? So that is, a, is you know, adaptation and modification is, is a real common, you know, necessity in communities as you look at evidence-based programs. So really the practical approach is a couple of things. One, try to modify as little as possible, okay? If you wanna to try to replicate those results, the further you get away from the, rep, the, the original, the less likely you are to get them. Okay. Second, another practical is what I said before. Try to do some evaluation work on what you're doing. You can possibly be in the position of contributing to our, our understanding of what's working by saying, we changed it in these four ways, it still worked. Sir? Uh, one tool that I think is very helpful is the OJWP uh, strategic planning tool. I mean, to me, that matrix makes it real easy. Uh, our truancy abatement program we thought was really good and like you said, it was so close to the chronic truancy initiative, we just had to make a couple of changes and we were getting evaluations and results and now we have an evidence which program where we're getting evaluations over 10 years. But I, I strongly recommend that, that matrix. I mean, it just makes it easy. You go to the age, 10 to 14, the programs come up. I mean, to me, I think everybody should use that planning tool. So, uh, Dennis, you want to say a little more about that? Well, tool? just a quick comment on that. Thank you. The strategic planning tool is, is through the National Gang Center, and it's a, it's a, I don't know that we referenced that in, at, in our last slide, but it, you'll find all those programs within the Model Programs Guide and within Find Your Info's um, uh, program tool as well. Uh, that's really the strategic planning tool is targeted for gangy types of stuff, <laughs> anti-gangy, gangy types of stuff. And I wanted to make a comment about that last bullet there, assessing readiness for implement, implementing an evidence-based program. I put out, we put out a solicitation two years ago, I think it was. It was a gang prevention, um, gang prevention solicitation. So we wanted to fund, we had a, a recent publication, evidence-based programs, promising programs, anti-gang programs in the secondary prevention uh, area. All of the programs coming from the strategic planning tool. We received, I think it was about 175 applications. We funded 12. Eight of those 12 programs were boys and girls clubs, uh, targeted um, outreach prevention and intervention programs. And there was a very specific reason that the majority of the applications that we funded uh, were those programs, because there's implementation support through Boys and Girls Clubs of America to implement those programs. The other programs on that short list, uh, applicants would have to take a piece of that grant and contract with Build or Art or whatever pro. We even had one program in there that, that we, they couldn't find the developers <laughs> anymore. The developers weren't, weren't in operation anymore, so they couldn't get any information than what was already out there about those programs. Uh, and I think that's a that's very important when you when you really get into not tweaking what you have, but taking something off the shelf and trying to put it, uh, you know, meet meet a get meet a need or, or fill a gap. <coughs> Sir, I totally concur with what you're saying, but I don't know if all your evidence based folks understand that. I'm looking at one in the probation department in Sonoma County that I'm helping evaluate. They have to video every one of their sessions. They have to send it back. It was developed with a demographic that's different than the heavy Latino population they're dealing with. The activities sometimes don't work for these kids and, and they lose the kids, <laughs> yeah, but they aren't allowed to, to make those little tweaks to maybe get a more culturally based, right. class based, ethnicity based activity to substitute there. So, I mean, I, I think it's, the, the one suggestion I have is this is wonderful what you're trying to do, but somehow you need to formalize the way to practice continuous quality improvement right. in, in this process because um, I can tell you from being from Silicon Valley that, that continuous quality improvement is what's made that valley as dynamic as it is. And, it, and it, it's based on great research, it's based on great science, 
But uh, Tom Peters, who was kind of the father of Silicon Valley, the academic father of Silicon Valley, used to say, building your company based on evidence-based practices is like driving your car with a rear view mirror. And you really got to use the evidence-based practices, but you got to find the next right. level mm -hmm. of, of improvement on that. And, and I think that would avoid a lot of the problems we've got. The other big problem I've seen, and, and again, I'm not being critical of what you're doing. I think what you're doing is wonderful, but if you could form a way that when people make a few tweaks, so you've got a tweak now that works with Latino kids, let's get it to the people that, that are pushing this thing and, and convince them to allow them to do this and, and look at it so it doesn't feel so much like you've got to do this exact, I mean, it's unbelievable when you see this guy, he freaks him out and he has to send his video. Every, every week back to this company and 20 year grants that you funded. So, so that would be good and, then, and just that concept of continuous quality improvement. And the other, the other is get at some of the assumptions that are in there, right. that, that, that kind of the old Hawthorne effect that you got in research. The people who did the original thing were passionate about this thing. They right. cared, they, you know, they were really motivated. But if you take, we've learned this in education forever, you can take off the shelf reading program and give it to a teacher who doesn't believe in it, doesn't think it's a pain in the butt. So if you don't have a, a people who are willing to build relationships with those kids, you aren't going to get change. And if you don't have people who give a damn, you know, who are just going through the motions, you, you, you tell them, okay, go do this evidence-based program. Well, it's a piece of crap, you know, and they go through the motions. Exactly what we're fighting with CSPAC. Yeah. yeah. Internally. Yeah. 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 It's and so, interesting. Now, at the federal level now, we have a mantra, or that's not a mantra, it's we're here to help. And that's really where these databases came from. Uh, when I was when I was a juvenile parole officer, it's it was do no harm. So we're here to help, but we really rely on you to do no harm. So the, this information here is, uh, I mean, it is hard to implement an evidence-based program with in, integrity. And there is no anywhere I've gone, I've never heard one community say we're the same as another community. Uh, I mean, that's something that that I think uh, Phelan will stress, and my other analysts will will stress is that there are that that there is that accountability left on you when you implement those programs to make those tweaks uh, to make those to track and monitor the success or the, the failures and, uh, and and you know I want to recognize Peter Ellis's comments here and, and, and his contributions to, to San Jose I mean one of the things that Peter's been able to do with the, his partners in San Jose is really build that continuous quality improvement into their overall strategy. And, and I've been really impressed with the work that your organization does in terms of putting together uh, performance metrics uh, and really in a very, uh, you know, to really in, in ensure accountability for those, the way those dollars are spent. I think there's still, a, a, there's a lot of tension still in this evidence-based movement, if you can call it that. And, and you really put your finger on one. Um, the, you know, when I talk, uh, when I started off and I talked about this, you know, the purists would say, you must, you know, implement with complete fidelity. Well, that's what that's what Peter's touching on. That's what you know Dennis is talking about too. Is that and it, and it comes down and it might be funded through our money, might be funded through the state. Those are decisions that are made at a policy level, and they say, you know what, this program, we're so sure about this, and this gets back to some of those therapeutic programs probably that uh, have really had decades of testing at some of the most rigorous levels. They say, we are so sure about this, we really, we're gonna lock down. It's gotta be implemented this way. Is that the right thing to do? Is that really getting the results? What kind of tensions does that create? I think you're putting your finger on a number of the key issues there. Uh, Ma'am, I think you, Nancy. Yeah, um, I, I in the implementation research, that whole notion of fidelity and latitude is a, a really important factor to determine what are those core elements to right. which you must have strict fidelity, and then what are those areas you know that you have to be open to the latitude, and, and that's a key piece of, of that. Also, in the social sciences, it's just uh, with the, the type of research that we do, it's very hard with the generalization. You can't general, you know, as you were talking about with the uh, the validity of it, you know, with the uh, external validity to be able to generalize from one population because of all those things we've talked about to to general, the general population. So that's why I think the fidelity and latitude is a really important point um, in, in anything that we're going to do. Jeff. Um, and I just want to um, echo some of these comments. Um, 
I, I guess I've been doing research full time for about 25 years now, and I'm almost at the point where I'm going to announce I'm opposed to the evidence-based movement because of what it's become. Right. And to me, how do you get on this panel? <laughs> to me, it's it's like saying free market economy. Yeah, that'd be great if we had a free market economy. But there's monopoly, there's coercion, there's right. irrational behavior, and to say we we're going to have an evidence-based policy movement ignores, like you, I, to pursue the metaphor from Peters of driving looking in the rear view mirror. People need to realize they're looking in a rear view mirror which is like a Hollywood set which has been constructed for them right. by past decision makers. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, there's a theoretical bias at play in how we explain crime to ourselves and how we explain why young people get in trouble. And the money flows to solutions and programs that match that, that bias. And the bias is usually Kids get in trouble because there's something deep inside of them that's broken and they're different from you and I and they're certainly not, not like your kids and so they need psychiatrists and therapy. And some, some kids definitely do need that. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of young people don't need that. They need more constructive things. But it's really hard to do research on a program that says our intervention model is rooted in you know, positive youth development right. and activities and youth leadership and voice and civic engagement. and. It's really hard to break that into small pieces that you can videotape and send back for fidelity purposes. So the bias plays out in terms of the record of research we have to rely on. And we have to rely on research, but we need to be conscious of who built that sound set we're looking at in the mirror. Yeah. So let's continue to the next, the next myth, because it touches on an issue that we've been talking about. So everyone agrees on the importance of evidence-based programs, and everyone sees it the same. <laughs> what we've been talking about. Right? Everybody, it's policy. all the same thing. It's a monolithic topic and the issue, and, and once we say evidence, we all know what the heck we're talking about, and everyone agrees. Well, no. Okay, so there's a lot of ways we could cut the response to this particular myth, this myth. but um, really, at the end of the day, everybody's got a lot of different interests that are driven by the work that they do, the pieces of the puzzle, right? So, so you've got a lot of players who are going to be involved in um, your youth violence response in any city across the, the country. You got policymakers, and all these people are, you know, they may all be together on saying this is an important problem. We need to come together. We need to focus on this. We're going to address it together. But at the end of the day, they have some different priorities and needs too. And so, you know, policymakers, they need to manage budgets. They've got to increase their confidence in public investments. That's what Dennis was talking about a second ago. Uh, we're, we're sitting over here going, you know, I, I, I want to demonstrate, and we, we want to demonstrate to Congress that we're being good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. You know, we might make five awards on this grant, but we know we're drawing tax dollars from all parts of the country. So why does it make sense for us to do this, right? So, and that happens at every level. That's federal, but you know, it could go right down to your city council or your local police chief or what have you. Um, vendors or program developers, well, they've got a self-interest. You know, they're trying to get out there and sell their products, so they're going to be thinking of evidence-based. They might say, well, you know, it's evidence-based. Uh, you got to do it my way, and by the way, you got to buy your products from me. You got to get your training from me, etc. So there's a lot of self-interest there. Academic researchers, you know, you bring in a research partner. That some places have had this experience. They're sort of hoping for a partner. The partner is actually thinking about that publication he's going to get or she's going to get that's going to help her or him get tenure. You know, they're not necessarily thinking as their top priority, I want to be your partner and help you get the information you need. Okay. Practitioners, again, may feel like they need to protect those well-established established practices, those things that that they just know, I've been doing it right all these years, you can't tell me that there's a new way to do it. And one of the metaphors I use is, you know, I, I don't want to turn this kind of work into a, a profit-driven business model. But one of the things that you notice if you look at the folks in the business world is, first of all, you walk into any bookstore and there's a huge section on how to do just a little better. You know, a huge section, all those books, they say the same thing, it's going to help you get that edge, help you get ahead. You know, and so there's something about the sort of uh, the business community and that sort of entrepreneurial spirit that that we might want to take a second look at, which is this idea that 
there's room for continuous improvement. This is your point. Yeah. You know, there's room for continuous improvement. So we need to build evidence. We need to be willing to say, you know, hey, I know I've been doing it this way for 15 years, but maybe there's a something different. You know, even Barney Malekian, when he talked about it as, as you know, as an officer on a tactical, uh, you know, operation, you know, just something after all those years, for whatever reason, something clicked in his head, and, and he started thinking, you know, maybe there's a different way we need to approach some of these issues. Okay. So I'm going to move to our next myth, in the interest of time. Um, so building a complete response to youth violence is mostly a matter of just selecting and implementing the right mix of evidence-based programs. Right. So it's not. Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about, you, you, you used the word or term I even, maybe I brought it in here somewhere. You talked about uh, the political economy of research funding. Why don't you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I guess that's what I was alluding to with who constructed the set. Um, uh, and people know this instinctively, but um, the, the world of researchers out there, um, there, people are competing for funding. You can't do research without funding. You can write papers and write thought pieces and qualitative stuff. But in order to get into the game of generating evidence that will affect policy and program development, you have to have resources. And so we're, we're all out there competing and writing proposals. Um, and it's hard work, um, and some people are better, better at it than others. Um, and it also depends upon, as I said before, what your, your career focus is on. It's easier to climb up the ranks of the tenure-seeking academic career ladder if you study something which has quick turnaround and easily controllable laboratory conditions than it is doing community-based comprehensive initiatives. That's really hard. And I once got a grant from a major foundation to do a community-based comprehensive evaluation. I remember saying at the time, I think I'm the perfect person for this because I'm just bad enough as a researcher to think I can handle this. Because <laughs> a good researcher would say, no way, I'm not going to spend my career capital. It's gonna, this study's going to take five years, and at the end, we're just going to have these associations and maybe promising signs. Right. The real ambitious researchers want to do something that's quick and rigorous, and they get out, and they got four peer-reviewed publications out of it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's right. difficult to balance the interests of researchers and practitioners. And the last thing I'll say, I was at a meeting once where we were talking about user-minded research. This is a British term, a meeting in England. And I, re I remember saying that I thought about research through this metaphor, that you write something, it's like, full, it's like making a paper airplane that you're trying to throw through the window of a moving train. And I thought I was being clever. And this, this woman um, said to me, sitting in the front row, I see, this, I see the world of research and policy in a completely different way, which is practitioners are out there running a marathon, and you're standing by the, 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 the road with a bottle of water reaching out to them, and they need it to be there when they're ready to grab it. And that's the research. Like the, support, the, the practice world is the research. And that affected me ever since. Yeah. yeah. Well, so one of the other ways to look at this political economy is in terms of what do we, what do we, you know, under what circumstances do we say we need more evaluation in a certain area? Okay. I had a strange exchange with somebody in the Office of Juvenile Justice a uh, um, couple of months ago. And she's very, very intelligent, knows the research, she's great. And, she had, and we were talking about evidence-based practice. She said, you know, we're kind of lucky in juvenile justice because we've got a lot of program evaluations and evidence-based programs. And she's right. And, but I couldn't help but reflect on the irony of that statement. Because going back in history, in the 1980s, it was none of this stuff works. None of this prevention stuff, none of this, you know, helping kids stuff works. We're not funding it anymore. Okay? So it was a response to that that a lot of people were like, wait a minute, I've been doing this work for years, but I didn't think it works. And the evaluation community started really focusing on those kind of topics. So we started building evaluation, a body of evaluation on those prevention topics to really kind of get to this question, does anything work? It's because it was under attack. Now, we look now that there's an evidence-based movement, we say, well, where do we lack a lot of evidence? How about policing? How about victim services, because nobody attacked those issues, right? Prisons. Prisons, <laughs> sentencing. They have a 70% failure rate. So, so, we right. keep funding them at 10 times what we spend right. on prevention. Right. <laughs> so there's a long way to go. When people talk about evidence-based programs, we've got a long way before we've got anything near sort of a complete menu of programs out there to draw from, okay? Um, but. With all that said, with all those caveats, with all those cautions, nevertheless, I come back to Martha's point. 
There are people who have invested a lot of time developing and refining programs, testing them, and, and putting together synthesis of this information so that folks like yourselves can benefit. We have very little time, but if you have a quick. I just think that this idea of fidelity and latitude and, and, and bringing that out into the, on the ground could make all the difference in the world. Because people who go into this work do it because they want to make their imprint. And if they're stuck in a box, there's, it just, they just don't have the juju. So this, I think, could be a fabulous tool. If I could just say, I think this is the most active area, is trying to figure out how to put parameters around what we mean when we say fidelity. And there's pros and cons on both sides. We did some work to look across prevention programs on different risk issues for adolescents, teen pregnancy prevention, substance abuse. Are they informed? Are they working right. off the same science? Right. You know, where are we on this? And we heard about a relationship education program that had demonstrated some very good results in a variety of settings. People then went to implement it. Well, the heart of the curriculum was to repeat things. These are teenagers. Provide them with repeated experiences right. to engage in particular kinds of skills. And when it was implemented, people thought, oh, this is really redundant. We can really improve on this program. <laughs> We will just do the core things once, and then we'll bring in a lot of other effective practices. So without knowing it, they had lost what best we knew was the engine of the original program. So that's one example. Then you have the opposite extreme, which is you have programs that were developed on non-Hispanic populations, and the materials need to be tra translated into Spanish, and there also need to be examples in the materials uh, that are meaningful to the participants in the program. So both of those things are going on. We are working um, to put together a guide for communities around sort of trying to answer these questions about what some of the parameters are that will go up on the website. It's, and I think the other thing that people are speaking to is it, nothing comes um, packaged for you. You have to take it up yourself. So you need actually to think with your program staff and their supervisors and the network of social service providers of what it means to pick up a particular program and see whether it seems better than what you're doing. And if, you know, it's all learning changes. So is the staff going to say, is this the flavor of the month or flavor of the year? Are they going to say, this is a great opportunity? Usually they want to know somebody's done it someplace else and they've gotten results and they want to use the benefits of the program. I'll just say, the world has moved this direction as we know, but in Health and Human Services, we're implementing three evidence-based initiatives. The Congress is writing into statutory language criteria for programs being evidence to get funded. This has resulted in a list of teen pregnancy prevention programs mm -hmm. that are up on the Office of Adolescent Health website. Mm -hmm. Now they need to be replicated. This is a whole different scale than what happened with the original programs. So people are actively trying to think through, what does it mean to pick up this program model? Will it work in my community? There is innovation money and money to test it as well. But as you look at the landscape for what might be available to you, um, there won't be another round of the teen pregnancy prevention grants for a while. The money is getting attached to these evidence-based programs. And some specific ways, and home visiting is probably the other big example, which can serve teen parents, can be your ground level prevention program. It too has gone through a process of Congress, including definitions of what constitutes an evidence-based program in statute that then have to be included in the implementation work. So that's just a reality check, but that is where some of the resources are that may matter for your community. And then there's a whole process going on of what does it mean to implement these things. So it's a, it's a very rich topic. It's an important topic. I wish we had more time, but unfortunately, that's the end of our time. I want to draw your attention to uh, the Find Youth Info uh, website. We talked about it earlier, so findyouthinfo.gov. The reason I'm drawing your attention to it is because your existing handout doesn't have this on there. So I really want you guys to you send us your presentation? I can, send you, I can send you the presentation. If it's probably already on the disc. But I'll double check. If it's not, then I'll send it to the uh, resource table. The resource table. Oh, okay. I'll get it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much.